Coming up on this episode of Inside the Epicenter. I would argue that he's become the most fascinating and most dynamic of the leaders in the Arab world. And he's building the UAE into an economic powerhouse, but also a tourist destination, a business destination. What if our enemies became our allies? What if countries around the Middle East that had historically been enemies of Israel suddenly became political and social and business allies? Well, we're going to ask that question today from someone who really knows. Hi, welcome to Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, a podcast of the Joshua Fund a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund, and we're going to address those questions and more to our founder and uh, my boss on this podcast, uh, Joel Rosenberg. Joel, it's great to be with you. Uh, You're in Jerusalem again, and uh, I'm here in Southern California, but God has linked us across the miles. You know, Joel, we've been talking in recent podcasts about your new book, Enemies and Allies. And uh, we've explored some really interesting things. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about how the uh, the book tour has been going and how the conversations around Enemies and Allies has been uh, taking place. Sure, Carl. Great to be with you. And shalom and, and marhaba and salam uh, from Jerusalem. It's been an, it was an exciting fall. Um, I was actually in the States for three months, Uh, Only one month of that was a formal book tour. That was the month of September. But I was also began the summer by speaking at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention in Dallas. I was the the keynote at the uh, Honoring Israel Breakfast with Pat Boone and and other wonderful uh, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ who deeply love Israel and are trying to get a sense of where are we now with Israel. We had just been through, of course, the rocket war, 4,500 rockets in in May, and then in June we were at NRB. I also interviewed uh, former Secretary of State, former CIA Director Mike Pompeo in, in, in the main general session. So that was kind of how we got kicked off in the summer. I also had a wedding. Yeah. Of our son, uh, Jonah, who uh, had just finished earlier in the spring uh, his uh, time in the Israeli Defense Forces in a special forces unit. Um, And he got married and uh, we're very, very happy about uh, uh, our new daughter-in-law. She is absolutely lovely. And um, so anyway, it was a a very full summer doing a lot of speaking. I got COVID, didn't know I could get COVID since I'd already been vaccinated here in Israel. But anyway... It was a, it was our full summer, and then and then the book tour, and uh, yeah, I think what made the enemies and allies book tour particularly interesting was that with the decision by President Biden to withdraw all U.S. forces out of Afghanistan um, by the end of August, right on the you know on the 20th anniversary uh, of uh, 9/11 or thereabouts and the collapse of Afghanistan to the Taliban, it really suddenly put this question right on the front burner. You know, who are our enemies and how do we handle them? (laughs) Or what's the right way from a policy side to handle enemies? It's interesting, it's very different, right, from how followers of Jesus Christ are supposed to handle an enemy. We're supposed to love an enemy, but a nation state is supposed to protect itself against the enemy and and try to defuse the threat from that enemy. So that was a big conversation. And then how do you treat your allies? If the Afghan government was our ally and the Afghan army was keeping the radical Islamist terrorists at bay, why exactly did we cut their legs out from under them? And and, Mm. and so that really was a very interesting, I mean, tragic. I I wouldn't have wanted it that way, but it, it sort of set the table for a conversation that Americans had not been having, honestly, for the last several years, right? right? Because we, at least in the United States, the the issue of COVID, the issue of vaccines, so controversial, the issue of a bitter partisan political environment and campaigns and closed churches and all the race riots. I mean, those were the issues uh, that were dominating. And so why would you talk about Israel? Why would you talk about the Muslim world? Why would you talk about the Iran threat or Afghanistan or anything else? Mm-hmm. But 
I guess I owe a, a thank you note to President Biden because, in a sense, because he certainly the, set that table. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was a, it, it was crisscross the country. I did hundreds of interviews and spoke at uh, events and and, uh, yeah. and and churches all over. It was exciting, and I. Uh, I was happy to see the book become a national bestseller. Yeah, indeed. It was very exciting to be with you on a lot of those experiences and to listen to some of those conversations firsthand with uh, Mike Pompeo and, and others. And, and to to see the reception for this book has just been remarkable. You know, the last time we spoke about the book, Joel, we were talking about some of the opportunities uh, that exist there, particularly in the uh, in the countries of Jordan and Egypt. And and for our listeners, again, just to remind them, you know, these countries historically have have sent uh, armies against Israel. They have created, you know, incredible amounts of tension in the region historically. But but there's some tremendous opportunities that have been growing over the last several years. And we saw that both Egypt and uh, Jordan, through uh, other uh, means, uh, came to peace treaties with Israel. But something developed, uh, and you talk about greatly in your book, in some of the other countries in the region. But maybe you could just give a quick recap of, of some of the opportunities that we've talked about in Jordan and Egypt before. Sure. Well, I, one of the most interesting uh, moments in my life in recent years was being invited to meet with President el-Sisi, uh, the president of Egypt, and not only with him— and his inner circle of, of, of top advisors and cabinet officials and Muslim senior clerics and so forth. But he sort of insisted that I take the evangelical leaders that had come with me and go have tea with Mrs. Sadat. Okay, Jihan Sadat was the widow of Anwar Sadat. And we had tea with her in her home, the very home where then President Sadat ordered the, and designed the surprise sneak attack against Israel on Israel's highest holy day, Yom Kippur, uh, the Day of Atonement in 1973 mm. in October. And that was horrifying for Israelis, and Israel almost lost that war. It was very, very scary. But that house that we were in was also the house where President Sadat planned another sneak attack uh, surprise uh, initiative, and that was his trip to Jerusalem wow. in 1977 when he stunned the world by saying, I would go to Jerusalem and I would make peace with the Israelis if they were open to it. And Israel said, all right, why don't you show up and yeah, let's see up. if you're really doing that. So to, to sit with Mrs. Sadat in that home, her showing us as evangelical leaders and two of our sons, two sons who had served in the Israeli Defense Forces in combat units, to have her show us pictures and, and describe what it was like for her husband to shift from the worst enemy mm. of Israel in the modern era. Mm. You know, and Egypt, of course, you know, you can go back to uh, uh, Charlton Heston taking on Yul Brenner. <laughs> Right in in the Ten Commandments, right as Moses right. and uh, and the Pharaoh. I mean, this right. this history of Egypt and Israel goes way back. Right. But to be in that house, to hear from her, and I described that tea and that conversation in Enemies and Allies. But that's the lightning yeah. fast change, in a sense, uh, the the tectonic change that led to the Camp David Accords in 1979, and uh, and the first ever. Arab-Israeli peace treaty, which meant it could be done. Yes. No one had ever seen it in human history. I mean, not going back to, you know, I don't know, yeah. Hiram of uh, the king of Lebanon, Tyre, Tyre yeah, right. making you know peace with Solomon because of his love for his father, David. Or you go back to the queen of Sheba, the, the monarch of the Arabian Peninsula coming to Israel. And OK, but except for things like that, we had not seen Arab-Israeli peace ever yeah. And the entire Arab world turned against Egypt for doing it, for making peace with Israel. And, uh, yeah. and it took a few more years, actually, um, almost 20, for the next Arab country to make peace with Israel. And that was the king of Jordan, then King mm -hmm. Hussein. And, of course, as I describe in the book, as you and I have discussed, I have had the opportunity to get to know the king's son, now King Abdullah II, who is a man of peace. And so 
those were big because, as you say, those those were real battles. That was war. That wasn't just economic, you know, boycotts or political resistance to Israel. That was full on multiple wars that uh, cost a lot of Israeli lives. Huge, huge tectonic shift when those things happened. But um, we're going to take a quick break right now, Joel. But uh, when we come back, there was another tectonic shift that you write a lot about that just happened literally within months of when we're talking right now. It's the Abraham Accords and the countries that were involved with that. So we want to get back and talk more about what those opportunities look like for our new allies in the area. Hi, this is Joel Rosenberg. There is nothing more powerful than prayer. We serve a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. So if you would, take a moment right now and pray for our many partners across the epicenter. Many of them regularly face persecution, harassment, and many, many difficulties. And your prayer could make a tremendous difference in the war against evils that face them. We know how the story ends. Let's pray to that end together. So, Joel, I want to pivot for a moment because those two, uh, Jordan and Egypt, uh, their uh, peace treaties with Israel sort of became part of the landscape over several decades. They became sort of, okay, well, they have a peace treaty, but all of the other nations in the region are still hostile to Israel. And, you know, we've talked about the threats from Iran and we've talked about some of the radicalism that's still, you know, very present in this. But something happened with the UAE and Bahrain First of all, the UAE, I, I'm not sure many Americans understand <laughs> the structure and what the UAE is. They're like, well, it's a city, it's a, it's a city state, it's, what is it? So, uh, well, the United Arab Emirates is a country less than 50 years old. I mean, uh, yeah. actually exactly 50 years old, sorry, this year, uh, 2021. So uh, I was born in 1971. It had been a British uh, protectorate or colony. Uh, mm -hmm. Prior to that, uh, the United Arab Emirates is uh, a country composed of seven different sectors or emirates. Um, mm -hmm. So it, this is the United Arab Emirates and Emir, E-M-I-R, an Emir in Arabic is like a king or a governor, a ruler. Mm -hmm. And so there were seven different rulers of these different sectors of this small country, but incredibly wealthy country because it sits on enormous amounts of oil, some natural gas, and it has turned itself over time into a financial services sector, a tourism destination, a shipping magnet, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, in its dusty, uh, remote fishing village 1960s, nobody saw the set of emirates uh, as significant at all. The founder of the country, though, was a, a fascinating Muslim man named Sheikh Zayed. Mm -hmm. Sheikh Zayed. And mm -hmm. what's interesting is that he had a vision for pulling these six other leaders and uh, into one country, gaining their liberation from the British, but maintaining good relationships with the British and building the most dynamic and exciting and I would say progressive, but I don't mean in the American political sense, right. you know, uh, an Arab country that's making Forward progress. Thinking. Yeah. And his son, Mohammed bin Zayed, mm -hmm. has really uh, taken over in, in, you know, since uh, his father's death uh, to take the UAE, United Arab Emirates, to a different level. And it was his decision. Uh, he, he's widely and fondly known in the region by his initials, MBZ. Yes. And MBZ has taken the UAE to a dramatic new level. I mean, right. literally just, just taking off a few things. Invited the first evangelical delegation in the history of the UAE wow. uh, to meet and, and visit the country. That's the trip I led. A few months later, he invited Pope Francis to be the first Roman Catholic pope to ever wow. come to the Arabian Peninsula, much less the UAE. Uh, he declared that year then the year of tolerance. We're Muslims, but we're moderates. We are tolerant. We like Christians. We, we like Jewish people. We want to build friendships. Then he sent the first 
rocket to the, uh, I think to the moon, or at least to, uh, they right. were doing a landing. And now they've got a, a rocket that's going to Mars. And then they decided to make peace with Israel, <laughs> something that MBZ told me personally that he was going to do two years before he did it. Wait. We were shocked. And that story is in the book. Wait, I was going to say, Joel, you, 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 I knew you met with him, but you, you got that, you got some of the insights early on. Tell me about your meeting with MBZ and, uh, and just, you know, what kind of a person is he? Well, he is a fascinating leader because uh, he, um, he doesn't like to talk in public. He doesn't give speeches. He almost never gives an interview. He is a behind the scenes strategist. And he's tall. I mean, very tall, thin, mm. lanky, uh, nice, uh, thin beard. He, he wears white robes uh, and uh, the white headdress with the black, uh, the black cords around it that are mm. very classic very to the Gulf generally yeah. and to, certainly to the UAE in particular. Wears sandals in meetings. Like, the guy is straight out of central casting <laughs> for an Arab Gulf leader. Now, yeah. He doesn't like to be public. What he likes to do is build things, you know, mm. by by strategy. And uh, I would argue that he's become the most fascinating and most dynamic of the leaders in the Arab world. And he's building wow. the UAE into an economic powerhouse, but also a tourist destination, a business destination. Right now, uh, and for the next six months or so, the World Expo. Mm. is there, yeah. uh, it's being hosted there. This is like the modern equivalent of the World's Fair. Wow. And it is fascinating. I'm heading to the UAE uh, in a few weeks to go back. I have multiple, multiple trips I've taken. But the key is this guy is a visionary and he is trying to build a brand. He knows that too many people, not just in the West, but in the East, see the Arab Muslim world as hostile, as warmongers, as mm. terrorists. Now, it's not really true of the people, right? But it is true of a lot of the countries and the leaders over the last, you know, 100 years. There's been a lot of sure. Arab wars and a lot of terrorism and a lot. Sure. So he's saying, I want our country to be known as not that. <laughs> we want to be <laughs> the friends of the West, the friends right. of America. We want to be known as, as as making progress in science and technology. And we want to be open to people of all faith. One of the reasons he's able to do it is not just because he believes it, which is the most important, but he knows that the values of the Emiratis are very warm, welcoming, and hospitable. Why? Mm. Because only one in 10 of the people who live in the UAE are actually citizens. Only it's one in 10, 10%. Really? 90% are foreigners who have come to work in the oil field and right. work in the construction industry and work in hotels and hospitality and finance. So 90% of the country are people who aren't- Emirati. Emirati, therefore they're, most of them are not Arabs. Most of them are mm. not Muslims. So by definition, they need to be open. They need to have these values of tolerance. So people want to live there, mm. right? Last point I would just say on that is, you know, before finding oil, the UAE was a fishing and trading port. So again, you have to welcome people who want to come and feel safe there. And that's what he did. But the key game-changing moment that I describe in the book is he decided that one of his goals was to be the next Arab country that made peace with Israel. Wow. Because he believes that Israel and the United Arab Emirates is very similar. High tech, high tourism, global in, in outlook, not inwardly focused. And he thought, you know, Arab money and entrepreneurship with Israeli entrepreneurship and high technology, he thinks that's a match made in heaven. Yeah. I think he's right. And so when he welcomed us into the palace for a two hour off the record discussion at the time, wow. uh, we wanted to know what his views were on making peace with Israel, but we didn't expect him to say, I'm doing it. I'm gonna be the next guy, Joel. And then he was, he's the first country, the United Arab Emirates to enter the Abraham Accords. Yeah. And um, it's his visionary decision with President Trump helping and of course, Prime Minister Netanyahu here in Israel, 
that changed the dynamic and, and set into motion other Arab countries to say, you know what? Yeah, it is time. Bahrain, Morocco, Sudan, and then another Muslim country, Kosovo, who all followed in succession from MBZ's leadership. That is incredible. I, I mean, one of the most fascinating things as you as you read the book and as you get into this is the almost domino-like way that some of these things took place and are continuing to take place. Let's not, you know, uh, step away too far from the uh, the Abraham Accords. They're, they're continuing to evolve within the context of different meetings. You mentioned you're going to the UAE and there are business delegations being put together, you know, that we're you know, kind of a part of as well. I mean, this is the kind of exciting uh, developments that that when one looks back, wow, this is sort of like a front row seat to history, to how things are going. Tell me, when you met with MBZ, you know, just give us one takeaway from that. You know, one thing that you would say, man, that was probably a front row seat to history. Yeah, we, we it's true. We got a front row seat and a backstage pass. That, and, <laughs> and, and for those who either read enemies and allies or who get it on audio and just download mm -hmm. it to your phone and listen to it on the way to work or to school or, you know, going shopping or whatever. Uh, that's that's a great way. A I love, about I love audio books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And listening to this, of course, but uh, getting th through books you would want to read, but you may not have time in your normal life. I, I get through a lot of books on audio that I wouldn't sure. otherwise have, but I tell this story and, um, and let, let me give you the takeaway. I mean, you would think that, him telling us that he was going to make peace with Israel, you know, Dayenu. In Hebrew, we say this alone would be enough. And I hope over time our podcast uh, listeners and viewers start to learn that term because I'm going to use it a lot. Mm -hmm. I already have, I think. But Dayenu, this alone would be enough. But here's another story. Uh, that, and, and this is the reason I'm going to the UAE for a celebration of the 60th anniversary of a hospital. Now, I'm not in the medical field. I'm one of the few Jewish people, you know, that didn't become a doctor. Okay. But uh, <laughs> so, like, why are you going My to the UAE? My Joel, the doctor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> paging Dr. Rosenberg. Paging Dr. Rosenberg. We really don't need you in the ER because you don't know what you're doing. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> why do I feel like that's going to be the teaser to the next podcast? But I whatever. I think so. I think so. So, uh, why am I going to the 60th anniversary of a hospital? Here's why. Because when we're sitting with MBZ, we wanted to get to know him. He's he's reclusive. He's a bit shadowy, not in a dark, negative sense, but we nobody knows him. He, and, and he's such a fascinating leader. So we, we were asking him lots of questions, how to get to know him. And he says, let me tell you a story. When my father was the emir of this area, you know, Sheikh Zayed, some American medical missionaries came to the UAE. This was prior to our independence. But they came and they said, look, we're noticing that the people in your, you know, in your country, would-be country, the healthcare system's not that good. And you've got a high infant mortality rate and other issues that are fairly, you know, simple, easy to solve, but you need more people to help. Could we open a clinic here? Mm. And Sheikh Zayed said, uh, and they said, would you give us permission to, uh, you know, to, to rent or buy some property and, you know, and, and open up a clinic? And Sheikh Zayed said, well, uh, my wife keeps having a series of miscarriages mm -hmm. and we don't have any children. But if you would stay and help her bring this next baby to term, she's pregnant now. If you will help bring this baby to term in a healthy way, I'll give you my house. So they said, well, of course we'll help uh, in any way we can. And sure enough, the baby was born very healthy. It was baby boy. Father and mother are super happy. That son is Mohammed bin Zayed. Oh that's, the, that's the son who emerged as the leader, the crown prince of the country. And that's the man we were sitting with. And he was telling wow. us this story, why he had such an affection for evangelical Christians generally, American evangelicals in particular. And yet he had actually never invited a delegation of evangelical leaders to come to the UAE. I was bringing the first at, at their request, at wow. his request. And that was an amazing story. And so 
um, on a subsequent trip to uh, the UAE, I actually had dinner with the the, the current president of that hospital. It's still, I mean, oh, and he did give the house, by the way. It wasn't his main house. It was another house, but okay, whatever, right? Uh, <laughs> Dayenu. And I don't know, I need to learn the Arabic word for Dayenu, but we'll get to that. Uh, but Note long story yourself. short, that has grown into the leading hospital in the country, wow. um, specializing in neonatal care and uh, maternal care, but not, not just that. And I had dinner with the president of the uh, hospital and the um, one of the board members, and they said, "Hey, uh, this was this was in December of 2020," and they said, "Listen, uh, in November of 21, that'll be our 60th anniversary. Mm. Would you come back and be with us for the uh, the celebration?" And the family's name was Kennedy. So it's the, mm -hmm. they call it in Arabic, the Kanad Hospital, but it's based yeah. on the name Kennedy. Yeah. Um, no relationship to the political Kennedys, but just a super story. You rarely hear the term missionary yeah. coming out of a Muslim leader's mouth in a wow. positive way. So, uh, you know, one of the things I, I and, and, you know, and you and our, our colleagues want to explore is what is God doing? Yeah. Not just in Israel and the immediate neighbors, but in this country that has made peace with Israel the yeah. first time since Jordan, the first time in a quarter of a century mm -hmm. after millions of Christians have prayed for the peace of Jerusalem. And again, mm -hmm. most Christians, you know, I mean, probably can't find the UAE, you know, immediately without a little bit of searching. Who are these people? Who are their yeah. leaders? Why do they like Christians so much? Um, we're going to go spend some time there and and let's do a podcast um, either from that. there or after that. Uh, yes, for as sure. As we explore a little bit more of what's going on. Yeah, for sure. Having you there will be amazing. And, and that is remarkable. What a thread. You know, I think we're going to talk a little bit later uh, in this podcast and maybe in ex, uh, subsequent ones about about the thread of God's providence through these accords. Let's be very clear. In this context, the very prince who was able to affect all of these changes, all of these reforms, and all of this peace uh, initiative with Israel was actually born in a Christian missionary hospital. And that that sympathy, that empathy for Christian work in the region and for God's work, perhaps, God is always using kings and princes who don't acknowledge him, but God uses them to bring peace and to bring, uh, we see that throughout scripture. So, um, Joel, I want to talk about another country. In Let me just region. say one thing, just yes. to be clear, you know, Crown Prince MBZ is a devout uh, follower of God. He's a Muslim, so Muslim. he doesn't see God the way we see from a biblical Old Testament, New Testament perspective. Well, I don't devout. want to leave the impression that he doesn't believe in in God or God's providence or or miracles, but it's true that we he and I come from very different uh, theological perspectives. Um, sure. So I just sure. want, just want to be you know because of my friendship with him and his team I, I want to be clear uh, he, he's, he's definitely a believer in God but not a believer that Jesus is sure. God and sure. um, that's that's an important difference that's um, an important we difference. acknowledge these differences I mean that's an, that is a key element here too can we build friendships with people who we disagree hmm. with theologically politically yeah. and I think we need to that doesn't mean it's not important to talk about our belief, deep, life-changing, game-changing beliefs it, it, that Jesus Christ died on a cross and rose again and is coming back and is God and is the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, that's a central message of the gospel. And we do want everyone to hear it, and of course we want everyone to believe it. Meanwhile, we need to build friendships and be able to have a conversation with people who don't agree with us 100%. because, as Paul said, how are they going to believe if they haven't even heard and how can they hear unless somebody tells them and tells them. at some point you have to be able to sit down and and, and talk to them and uh so uh, uh yeah yeah we we, we certainly element. agree on that and i would say every participant in the abraham accords in their own way felt like they were doing god's work um and i i believe that there's a, a very profound sincerity to those beliefs that needs to be incorporated more into our conversations with people whose beliefs differ from ours. Um, the sincerity, the, the approach, and I, and I just love the way your, um, your heart, I know you're not a diplomat, but you are very diplomatic 
in the way in which you address and engage with those that come from very different perspectives. I don't think you would have ever been invited back uh, or you'd ever been, you know, continuing to have a relationship with some of these uh, world leaders if you hadn't uh, understood that dynamic that in, in well, that I conversation. Well, I appreciate it. it. It's always possible to sell out the gospel in order to go have a meeting. That's true. I, but I don't want to do that. But I look to the example uh, throughout the Bible, but particularly the Apostle Paul. Now, admittedly, he was in chains when he was talking <laughs> to governors and to kings. You, you go through the book of Acts as just an example. Even before he gets to Caesar Nero, which we don't get to see, that would have been a wonderful chapter. Yeah. Uh, talk about high tension and high, uh, high stakes. But even when he's in prison in Caesarea and he is explaining very carefully what he and, and openly what he believes mm. about Christ, how Christ has changed him. He's sharing his testimony. He's sharing the gospel, but he's doing it in a very diplomatic and friendly way. Mm. And at one point, you know, the king even says, "What are you trying to convert me?" He goes, "I want you to be exactly as I am, except of course without the chains." But he does it in a very winsome. Way And I just think there are lessons. Now, admittedly, not all of us are going to have these opportunities where God opens the door to actual kings and crown princes, presidents and prime ministers. But I hope that those who read Enemies and Allies or just listen to the podcast realize, look, God will open up lots of different types of doors for different types of relationships in your life. Like, yes, it's, it's hard enough to share the gospel and have it build a winsome, loving, Christ-centered relationship with your parents if they don't believe, or mm. with your kids if they don't believe, mm. or your neighbors. But what about your boss? What about the mayor of the city? What about the head of the school board of the city council who might be hostile, right? Yeah. How do we live in a way that we can advance our values in a practical way, but also be a witness for Jesus, uh, for the gospel, um, with those who may disagree with us, and some may vehemently disagree with us. That's something we all need to know how to do better than we probably do now. That is one of the greatest practical applications of Enemies and Allies as a book. I, I really do believe it helps us deal with the fact that we are all confronted at times with those that have been our enemies and that we would love to see become allies or build bridges of love and trust again with those. And whether it's a family, a work situation, a ministry situation, or things where things have been broken, maybe for years, Enemies and Allies as a book gives us a pattern of how to approach and how to engage on some of those things. And I, I, I'm so glad you brought that part of the book up because it sometimes people look at these uh, books about, you know, these nonfiction books of history or, you know, facts of, of current political, and they go, what, what would that have to say to me? But there are many, many people listening right now whose lives are impacted by fractured, broken relationships that need to understand how, how to bridge those things. And the pattern that you set up in, in the Enemies and Allies book, the what God has done to bring peace there is amazing. In, in, and I think you know, the, other, the other principle is the principle of asking God to open doors yes. to relationships and to opportunities to be his witness uh, in sort of crazy places if we're willing. And sure. I, I believe that we serve a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God, a God who loves to open doors if we'll ask. Now, sometimes he opens us and he sort of pushes us through because he just has a sovereign will and we may not be listening, but he'll do it anyway. But Paul asks the followers of Christ, pray for him for open doors. Yeah. And I think it's a wonderful principle. And I want to ask our listeners and viewers, keep praying for open doors. Not because we want to go visit palaces and be in motorcades. I'm talking about doors of every kind. The key is obedience. If a door opens... Mm. To a neighbor, to a parent, to a to an enemy, to an ally, to whomever, are we going to go through it? Mm. But I think we should be aiming a little higher and not just be praying, um, you know, that, um, you know, well, I do I do like to pray for parking spots, by the way, or, you know, or uh, <laughs> yeah. whatever. But so I, I do believe in praying for things that are seem small. Sure. But I also say. Often we, our prayers are, oh, Lord, please bless me. Oh, Lord, please bless my children. Oh, Lord, yeah. uh, have mercy on me and give me strength. Those are 
fine, but they're not really what I call audacious prayers where we yeah. aim a little higher. Lord, could I be a witness to the head of the school board? Could I be a witness to my whole class in school, in college, in elementary school, high school? Could I be a witness to my whole army unit? Yeah. Uh, whatever. I mean, things that you think, oh, oh, I don't know if I'd even want that door to open. It's good to start praying and asking God, would you use me for yes. whatever little time I have on this earth? Joel, that is so powerful. And I know both of us were talking to a friend a few weeks ago uh, who said they had heard you say that you wanted to do this with these delegations. And they said, he's absolutely crazy. They'll never happen. Yeah, that was and a board member. It was a board member. <laughs> he loves me. I love him. But he's like, oh, that guy's a nut. He's I just, mean, come he's on. That's just never gonna whistling happen. in the wind, right? With that one. Well, look, uh, uh, there's so much to talk about here. That's just really incredible uh, richness. And of course, we're going to come back and talk about another whole aspect of the Enemies and Allies book about what we do and how we can take it from here. But I want to talk about one more country in the book. And it's a country that did not join the Abraham Accords, Saudi Arabia. Many things are happening there. But tell us, you know, what you see in opportunities with, with Saudi Arabia. It's, you know, it's such an, an enigma to most Americans. Yeah. Well, again, I think that's going to be, um, you know, a, a podcast unto itself. But <laughs> I will say there are major sweeping changes going on in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, of course, is, um, you know, the home of the two most sacred sites to the Muslim people, Mecca and Medina. And for most of the last several hundred years that the Saud family has controlled the Arabian Peninsula, it's been about 300 years, they have considered themselves a forbidden kingdom, only accessible to Muslims. You can come on a trip to Saudi Arabia, but you're coming as a Muslim yeah. to visit Mecca or Medina, right? Or, or as an oil executive. Okay, fair enough. I, you know, but mostly they have not. You know, the Saudi royal family has not seen themselves as opening up the, you know, their arms and saying, "Come, come and see, come and visit, come be part of it," like the UAE has, like Bahrain has, like some of the other Gulf states who don't have. Mecca and Medina at their core. So they have different religious sensibilities. They're, they're devout Muslims, but they see themselves differently. And, you know, the smaller Gulf states, specifically as we described with the UAE, you know, if, if 90% of your population is a foreigner, you, you have to be open. Right. Why would they come? Why would they say, stay? Why would they work there? Why would they pay taxes, et cetera? So, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a thing. But the Saudis have not seen themselves that way. But they are changing they're changing. Uh, their young crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, mm -hmm. widely known by his initials, MBS, has a vision, he calls it Vision 2030, to completely transform the kingdom of Saudi Arabia into what I would say, he wouldn't say it this way, but is much closer to the UAE or Bahrain or some of the other countries where why don't we have entertainment in our country? Like why do, you know, Saudi Arabia didn't have movies. Yeah. You couldn't go to a movie theater for the last 40 years. And now AMC movie theaters are opening up everywhere. They're having concerts. There was no concerts in wow. Saudi Arabia since 1979. Why? Because in 1979, two dramatic events happened in the Middle East. Uh, one, the Iranian revolution happened and the moderate... Uh, pro-Western, pro-American, pro-Israel leader of Iran, the Shah of Iran, uh, Shah Pong, uh, Reza Pahlavi, was overthrown and kicked out of the country for a radical Islamist known the, as the Ayatollah Khamenei, or Khomeini, Khomeini, sorry, uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini. And then the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in December mm -hmm. of 79, and that radicalized Afghanis and other Arabs throughout the region to come against the godless communist Soviets. And then one more event happened uh, right around that time, which is a group of radical Muslims, including a leader who said he was the, the Islamic Messiah or wow. savior known as the Mahdi. They took over the Grand Mosque in Mecca. 
Wow. They literally took it hostage. And it was a huge embarrassment and a catastrophe. And, and the Saudi leadership decided because of those confluence of events that it had to become radical too. Mm. That it had to get rid of music and movies and make women wear all this, you know, mm -hmm. completely covering garb and have hostility towards Christians and Jews and whatever. And it has marked Saudi Arabia for the next 40 some years. And this new crown prince has said, no, enough of that. I don't want to live in that country. I don't want to be part of that country. I don't want to be known as that type of country. We're changing. And the young people are with him. 70% mm. of Saudi Arabia, their residents and their citizens are under the age of 35. So they're excited about the idea of concerts and movies and soccer games and women driving and mm -hmm. they, because they've seen television. They've been on the internet. They know what the rest of the world looks like and they don't want to be in a sort of a Taliban-esque country, an Iranian regime oppressive country. Now, just to finish that riff, MBS is a very controversial figure. The big question, of course, is Will he make peace with Israel? But there's other questions too, all of which I deal with in the book because I'm one of the few people that have ever gotten to meet him. There are literally biographies that have been written um, in which the authors have never met him, much less interviewed him, much wow. less interviewed him on the record. A New York Times reporter wrote an entire biography on MBS, never met him. Never met him. Two Wall Street Journal reporters wrote an entire biography on MBS, never, never met, met him. A CIA senior analyst uh, dealing with Arabian issues uh, wrote a book uh, about the US-Saudi relationship, including on MBS, never had met him. So wow. Enemies and Allies becomes the first, it's the only book, it's not just the first, but it's the only book where the author has met MBS and spent hours and hours on the record <laughs> yeah. talking about the most sensitive issues of human rights, of relationship with Iran, of why do you have so many crazies in your mosques preaching bad things? What about all the terrible things that are taught in Saudi textbooks? Yeah. When and how are you gonna change that? Why are there no churches yeah. in Saudi Arabia? I mean, that's why I say this is a whole podcast unto itself, but yeah, it is. my colleagues, my evangelical colleagues and I, we went through everything. I mean, not everything. I mean, a lot, all the major issues that people would want to ask him about that those reporters, if they'd had their chance, would have asked him about, mm -hmm. including the murder of Saudi dissident Jamal Khashoggi and yeah. other human rights uh, controversies. And so, yeah, that's a, that's going to be interesting well, to unpack. But uh, it's, it's a country I'm fascinated with and never in my yeah. entire life until the last few years when I started to pray for an open door, did I ever expect to touch my feet on Saudi sand, much less be invited into the palace, Man. much less be the guest of the heir to the throne, wow. much less get to talk to him about Jesus. All of that is beyond Dainu. Beyond <laughs> Dainu, right? right. Uh, that is incredible, and it's such a compelling and powerful story. I know our listeners are going to want to uh, read about that because there's so much to unpack. As you said, we, we have much more to cover on this and we have much more to cover on, on the whole issue of the Abraham Accords. And our, on our next podcast, we're really going to dive into what are the Abraham Accords? Where, where did they actually, you know, originate and, and what are the implications as we go forward? Again, you know, part of Part of the great hope of reading Enemies and Allies for me was setting up where this is going to go and what God could be up to through this amazing tectonic shift in the history of the Middle East. So, Joel, uh, thank you so much. It's a good much. time to be going inside the epicenter, isn't it? Is it? Going, it, it is a great time to be going inside the epicenter. And, and I want to thank you for uh, this episode, you know. Um, and to our listeners, I am so grateful that you've uh, joined us on this podcast. You know, if you want to learn more about how God is moving in the epicenter through the Joshua Fund, head over to joshuafund.com and, and sign up for our e-newsletter. Through your emails, you'll hear encouraging stories of life change. It's going to bless you. I, uh, trust me, God is moving in the epicenter in powerful, powerful ways. And you know, if you found this podcast valuable, please get in touch with us. 
let us know who you are. Uh, what do you want us to talk about on the show? You know, we've we've spent some weeks here talking about this this book, but there are many many things God is doing in the Middle East, and we'd love to share uh, those stories as well. And and let us know what you want to hear about. If you have a question you want Joel to answer, go to joshuafund.com and and click on contact us. Feedback from you is incredibly valuable as we look to develop and and enhance this podcast. And as always, check out our show notes for anything you heard on the podcast that you'd like more information on. And for Joel Rosenberg, I'm Carl Muller. Thanks for listening to Inside the Epicenter.